Here is a world of communication, bringing together all people in a new era of understanding. Das 20. Jahrhundert, liebe Zuschauer daheim an den Empfangsgeräten oder von wo auch immer Sie uns gerade zusehen, das 20. Jahrhundert war kulturhistorisch eine Ausnahme. Diese These erläuterte uns in der letzten Woche der US-Rechtsprofessor Lawrence Lessig. Das 20. Jahrhundert war nämlich eine Zeitperiode, so Lessig, in der wir alle Kultur überwiegend passiv zu uns genommen haben. Das hat nun ein Ende. Digitale Technologien ermutigen junge Zeitgenossen inzwischen, sich zunehmend am Kreativitätsprozess zu beteiligen, weswegen sie nicht selten mit dem Gesetz in Konflikt geraten. Das Netz verändert unsere Welt jedoch noch wesentlich tiefgreifender, unter anderem indem es die Macht des alten Broadcast-Modells langsam aber sicher unterminiert. Umdenken müssen vor allem traditionelle Medienhäuser und Politiker, findet Lawrence Lessig. I think there's actually two things happening to traditional media. Um, one is that in the context of television, for example, the idea of the channel no longer makes any sense. Um, uh, you know, a channel was traditionally a thing which channeled viewers into seeing a per certain set of things. And in a world where there are three channels, that was very powerful in focusing the attention of a nation on particular subjects or culture at a particular time, that's gone. Television will be like bookstores now, where people, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of titles. You pick what you want, and you pick and read it whenever you want it. And the idea that you're going to read it, you know, in a certain order as you're told by the, um, uh, the media companies just doesn't make sense anymore. And people will increasingly demand that. And as they demand that, you know, this is the one thing the market's pretty good at, the will, market will begin to provide them what they demand. So the character of television will radically change. That's going to be good and bad. You can say it's good because you might be skeptical about really powerful cultural influences in general. Like why should one show or three shows dominate the attention of a culture? But on the flip side of that, a lot of people are troubled by the idea that common points of reference in a culture will disappear. Right? Um, and here's where I think historical perspective is really valuable. It is true that the 20th century was the century that created these kind of common points of reference that everybody experienced at the same time. But that was the only century in the history of man where that was true. Like that, you know, every time before that, you know, the idea of culture spreading was always uh, very haphazard and unpredictable. And, and in a certain sense, that's where we're going to get back to. Right? So there'll be certain things that spread and people get access to them. But there won't be the ability really to capture attention in the way that there was during the hip society of, of the 20th century. Um, so that's, that's on the sort of just consumption side of it. But then on the production side, it, it is the case that you're going to see a fundamental change in consumers' relationship to what they consume. Right? Even the vocabulary of the 20th century doesn't give us a way of describing it because we talk about consumers. Right? We're not talking about consumers anymore. We're talking about people who consume but produce at the same time. Right? Um, prosumers, you know, some people have said, but, but, but the, very, the idea here is that there's a generation, maybe not us, but, uh, but you know, kids 12 and 13, for whom the natural thing to do with stuff is not just to consume it, but to do things with it. Um, and Pew in the United States did a study of teenagers and found 57% of teenagers had created and shared content on the internet. Uh, that's a huge percentage of people who had thought it was important to create and spread their own creativity. And I think that's what's going to really change the way television functions. You know, you look at a national news program in the United States, which 30 years ago would have, you know, the three national news programs would have a huge proportion of the public. Now, a very small proportion of the public watch it. But when they watch it, um, you know, national news can only spend a minute or two on any story. So you have these very complicated stories that they have to cover in the most superficial way possible. And I often look at these reporters and I just feel bad for them. I'm embarrassed for them because, you know, they've got to describe a complex idea that really has 16 moving parts in three seconds or 10 seconds, uh, and they can't do it. 
And as people watch that, they increasingly recognize, well, if I really want to get the news or I really want to understand what's going on here, I'm going to go to the net and, and look at it in seven other places. Or, you know. um, so that you know, when there was only television, what else could you think except this was where you got your news? But now that there's these competitors that are much just as uh, vital and just as uh, um, um, visceral in your experience, then these competitors um, will increasingly make what goes on in television largely an embarrassment. You know, I write a blog, and there's this experience of writing a blog which I think is alien to major networks in the world. The experience is you write something and you know that the readership will be a function of how many people find it interesting. Because the more people who find it interesting, the more it will link to it and it will spread in that way. So in a sense, you really got to earn your audience at every single, with every single utterance. In the context of traditional broadcast media, that wasn't really true. Like maybe over a period of time, a station would become le a network would become less and less appealing, so people would shift away from it. But you know, people were in the ritual of watching news at a certain time. You just had your audience for that sake. Now, that makes life much more uncomfortable for this class of uh, creators. Um, but the thing to remember is that these were the exceptions. These fortunate <laughs> people were the exceptions to the way culture has been spread since the beginning of time. Again, think about books, right? Um, the world will become like books. You produce culture and you depend upon people recommending that culture to others as a way of spreading it. Um, it might be some advertisement to try to draw attention to it, but nobody's ever forced to read a book. Uh, um, and, and that's the way media is going to be. Increasingly, nobody's going to want... You know, I, I go to a hotel room now and there's a television set in my hotel room. And I think, what a waste of money and a waste of space. Why would I ever need a television set? I mean, it's not like I turn on the television set. Even if there are 100 channels, the chance of me seeing something I actually want to see is about 0.1%. So I don't even turn the television on anymore because everything I want to see or consume is on my machine. And my machine, actually more convenient, little laptop that I can sit you know, on the bed or whatever uh, reaching, than the television set would be. So the point is, we, we have flipped this around where... Media was something that was injected into people's minds, it was, it was pushed into people's space, and now all media will be pulled, and people will have to be convinced to want to pull it. Five of your friends recommending something to you because you read their blogs and they say it's great is a million times more powerful than advertisement you see about it on a, on a web page. The spread of technologies to enable people to become pamphleteers using digital technology, so blog technology or uh, easy remix uh, technology to make political advertisements has spread the capacity for political speech to a much wider range of people. Now, some campaigns in the United States in particular have begun to exploit this because um, when you have 10,000 people um, who not only support your candidate but want to go out and, and explain to the rest of the world why they support your candidate. So they write blogs or they organize meetups or they um, create materials to, to, to convince people to support this candidate, they're actually much more powerful supporters than the ordinary supporter of a political candidate. So contrasting the kind of broadcast or cadre politics of the 20th century, where um, uh, you 30, in the United States, 30-second commercials or um, simple uh, messages that are directed to a large range of audience, a large audience, contrast that to people participating and crafting and spreading the message. The second is a much more valuable, effective way of delivering political um, uh, messages than the first. And I think that's what you're going to see a shift towards in campaigns, as campaigns increasingly realize this is going to be part of the success for winning. I think it's not elites as much as generations. So uh, people who grew up in the couch potato culture will continue to be couch potatoes for their whole life until they'll die. <laughs> but then the generation that replaces them have a different set of expectations. So I don't think it's about next poor versus rich, although there is that issue too, uh, as much as it's about kids versus adults um, or 20-somethings versus 50-somethings. Uh, and um, the shift I think you're going to see is a shift that tracks the generations as they age. The idea to give the book away for free on the internet was the publisher's, not mine. Um, and what the publisher did was 
make a very shrewd calculation. Uh, realize that there are basically just two numbers you have to think about. One number is the number of people who now will not buy the book who would have bought the book because it was is now available for free. And you compare that number to the number of people who never would have seen the book before, but now that it's available free, have looked at the book and read part of it on the internet at least, and now are interested and now they decide to buy it. And if the second number is bigger than the first number, then you sell more books by giving it away for free. That's the bottom line, right? Um, now, I think this is a plausible strategy for some books, not for all books, so, um, or for some culture. So I don't think Madonna or John Grisham would make more money by giving away their stuff for free. Um, but I do think that new authors or niche markets or um, uh, authors who are trying to enter into a different kind of, they do plausibly benefit by making their work more accessible. Um, and there are particular examples that have been documented to make this absolutely clear. The fa my favorite is a South African research council, the Human Sciences Research Council, which had about uh, 150 researchers in 12 different research programs. And what they did was to publish research books. 2001, they decided to stop publishing and selling books. And they decided from then on they would make everything available free online. And then you could push a button and get print on demand, buy a print on demand version if you wanted, but that was optional. Everything was free. And then in 2005, they compared sales in 2005 to sales in 2001, right? So sales in 2001, everything was sold, nothing was free. In 2005, everything was free and it was an option to buy. But in 2005, sales had gone up by 300% relative to 2001. And again, if you think of that formula, it makes perfect sense. Who's going to buy a book from a South African Research Council you know, uh, in the United States or in Europe unless you can actually see or do something with it? But if it's available free, you look at it, you, uh, you find it interesting, and then you decide, like most people, you want to actually buy and own the physical work because it makes it easier to distribute, so then you buy the book. Um, so it's a method for increasing sales for at least a certain range, a certain kind of work. Yeah. It, I don't think we know enough about what the world of digital readers will, will look like. Um, but it, it certainly changes this particular dynamic. Because if everybody has a reader, then there's no incentive to be buying books, assuming they like to read off readers. Um, uh, so you're right. What I'm talking about is the existing world where people don't read off readers, they read off of books. Das, liebe Zuschauer, war der zweite und letzte Teil unseres Gesprächs mit Lawrence Lessig. Und wieder einmal greife ich mir die zwei aus diesem Satz, um eine nahezu Gerhard Dellingsche Überleitung zur Frage zu basteln, was ist eigentlich Web 2.0? Web 2.0 ist, wenn der Weihnachtsmann seine Geschenke über Google Ads finanziert. Vielen Dank. Es kommt, wie es kommen muss, liebe Zuschauer. Das ist das Ende unserer heutigen Sendung. Ich verabschiede mich und wünsche Ihnen eine inspirierte Woche. Bleiben Sie uns gewogen und schalten Sie auch das nächste Mal wieder ein. Bis dahin bleibe ich Ihr elektrischer Reporter. Für eine Gesellschaft wollen wir leben. Wir brauchen Ihre Antworten, Ihre Ideen und konkrete Projekte. Machen Sie mit unter www.diegesellschafter.de. Wir sind unsere Filter. Der Faktoidwasserfall der Informationsgesellschaft kann nur zu sinnvollen Gebärden gerinnen, wenn intakte, nicht neurotische Filter das Bad lustvoll gestalten. Alle anderen reagieren mit Varianten von Schmerz. Intuition ist die Daseinsnorm komprimierender Wissensarbeiter. <lacht>